לכבוד הוא לי לעונג לקדם בברכה בשם כולנו את דוקטור איבי קמפ, שכולם מכירים אותה והיא גם מדברת עברית, אבל לצערנו לא תרצה בעברית, אני מבקש את פרופסור ישי לוי להציג אותה. בוקר טוב, אני שמח מאוד שדוקטור אבלין קמפ, או כפי שנקראת איבי, הסכימה להגיע אלינו ולהרצות על נושא חשוב בתחום התמחותה, או מה שנקרא מי יטפל במטפלים. איבי ילידת אוקספורד, היא גם גרה באוקספורד ועובדת באוקספורד, היא סיימה יוניברסיטי קולג' בזמן לא רב בלונדון, זמן לא רב לאחר מכן היא עשתה עלייה לארץ, לגוש שגב. והעברית שלה היא הרבה בזכות חמש שנים של התמחות בפנימית ד', מאותם הימים היא זוכרת היטב את הטילים עפים מעל גוש שגב לכיוון חיפה בזמן מלחמת המפרץ. לצערנו היא לא המשיכה וחזרה לאוקספורד ושם התמחתה ברפואה תעסוקתית בבית החולים המפורסם רדיקליף, שזה קמפוס ענק, והיא חיפשה ומצאה נושא מיוחד שהוא בריאות הרופאים. היא מרצה בנושא הזה בכל העולם, אתמול למשל היא עשתה, השתתפה בסדנה בפקולטה לרפואה, תוך שימוש בטכניקות מיוחדות של רפואה התנהגותית. וזה נושא מיוחד שאנחנו מאוד מעוניינים לשמוע אותו, רק להוסיף שבשנים האחרונות היא פיתחה עניין מיוחד נוסף, ויחד עם בעלה סיימון היא מנהלת חווה לגידול פירות יער מיוחדים במינם, שהם בעלי ייחוד תזונתי ותכונות בורייתיות, ו... יש לנו הרבה מה לדבר על הנושא הזה, ואני מודה לך על הסכמתך לבוא לכאן, ואת ודאי תמשיכי באנגלית. תודה רבה. מאוד אשמח להיות פה, ואני מתנצלת שאני אדבר באנגלית, בסדר, אני מבינה עברית, וזה עדיין קצת קשה לי לתת כל ההרצאה בעברית. So good morning everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about the very important topic of occupational health and well-being for doctors. So, just to say what I'm going to cover this morning, I'm going to give you a short introduction to occupational medicine, an overview of some of the issues in doctors' health and well-being, talk a little bit about what we're doing in England and what we're specifically doing in Oxford and at our hospital. So, just so you understand the terminology that I'm using, I thought I'd just explain the training pathway in England. So we have medical school for five years, then this is like stage we have for two years. It's called foundation year one and foundation year two. And then if you go into family medicine, it's three years, and a minimum of six years as a hospital registrar to become a consultant or a specialist. So, What is occupational medicine? I just wondered, are there any occupational health practitioners? I know Michal is here. Anybody else is occupational health in the audience? Okay, no, all right. So, occupational medicine is a medical specialty which is all about how your health affects your work and how your work affects your health. Now, this is the father of occupational medicine. This is Bernardino Ramazzini. He was born in 1633, and he became professor of medicine at the University of Padua. And he wrote a wonderful book, which is great bedtime reading if you're good at Latin. Here it is, De Morbis Artificum. And he described diseases of many occupations. The one that I most like, this is written in 1700, remember, is his description of the sedentary worker. And as we get older, we, many of us become sedentary, sitting workers, sedentary workers. And this is what he said. All sedentary workers suffer from the itch, 
are a bad color and in poor condition, for when the body is not kept moving, the blood becomes tainted. Its waste matter lodges in the skin and the condition of the whole body deteriorates. And I think he got it absolutely right at that point. So this is where I work. This is the Oxford University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. It's a large teaching hospital in Oxford. We have four sites. We have 1,500 beds, 12,000 members of staff, about 1,600 doctors, and we say we have one million patient contacts per year. We also have very close contact with the dreaming spires of Oxford University. And this is my department. It's the Center for Occupational Health and Wellbeing. I have 20 members of staff. We have three consultants, three senior doctors, a trainee registrar doctor, a whole group of trained nurses. I have two physiotherapists. I have a psychiatrist that comes to the department as well. Um, we have um, a specialist in health promotion. We're doing a lot of work around the hospital on looking after um, our staff. Um, including um, workshops on stress management, looking at healthy food in the cafeterias, yoga, exercise, all sorts of things. And we look at all of these areas. We look at the person's um, journey through work from the first time that they come to the hospital all the way through to the time that they retire, uh, looking particularly at prevention of work-related ill health, rehabilitation if somebody is sick, um, health assessments for work, and a lot of education and training. And there's some important principles to understand. Uh, what we do is confidential. Our notes are completely separate to the notes in the rest of the hospital. We do say to people, though, if we're really worried about their health or the health of their patients, we will have to do something about it. But we're independent. We're there to support the employee and to give independent advice to the manager, the employee, and the organization. So, what about doctors' health and well-being? This has become a subspecialty of occupational medicine, and it's something that I've been interested in for about the last 12 years. Just a brief note about physical issues that we see in doctors, but I particularly want to talk about psychological ill health in doctors. We see lots of doctors with physical health problems that they have when they start work or they, they things that happen to them during their life. We, we have problems the same as everybody else, particularly looking at the moment at how best to support doctors and other members of staff living with cancer. Many people now are living with cancer, not dying from cancer. It's a very important distinction, and we're helping to support people in work in that situation. See lots of other work-related problems, lots of skin problems. We all wash hands, use disinfectant, wear gloves. Lots of musculoskeletal problems. I see doctors and other hospital workers looking down microscopes with neck problems, surgeons and other people manual handling patients with back problems, people doing a lot of ultrasound work with wrist problems. And we actually go, me and my physiotherapist, we go into the workplace and we look at the issues and try and sort them out. But I particularly want to talk about mental health today. Medicine is an amazing vocation, an amazing profession, but whether we like it or not, we have significant increase around the world of anxiety and depression compared to the general population, and significant problems certainly in, in Europe and America with drug and alcohol misuse. The BMA, did a, British Medical Association, did a study a couple of years ago suggesting that one in 15 British doctors have a significant problem with alcohol and drugs. And if that wasn't enough to depress you, we actually have significant increase in relative risk of suicide compared to other professions as well, uh, particularly in, in women more than men. In America, around 400 doctors a year commit suicide. That is the size of a small medical school. I mean, this is an epidemic. This is really serious stuff. And because we know what we're doing, our suicide incidents, our rates of suicide, they're more successful than other people because we have knowledge and access to drugs. The only bit of good news I can give you about this is we're not as bad as the vets, the veterinary surgeons. They have an even higher incidence of suicide, and that's because they have access to animal drugs and guns as well to shoot, to shoot large animals. So let's just talk about drug abuse. The the group with the biggest problems with drug abuse are, are anaesthetists. Not surprisingly, they have access to drugs and they know what to do with them. 
I say, stable incidents over the last few years. The majority of them are younger males and they are more likely to abuse IV drugs. The drug of choice for anaesthetists, sadly, is, is fentanyl. Uh, the good news is that if you can get a doctor to help and support, they actually have a very good prognosis with drug-related problems. However, if we look at the other end of the table in the operating theatre, uh, we should look at suicidal ideation in American surgeons. This was a big study that was done in 2010 uh, where they, the um, American College of Surgeons sent a questionnaire to all their members, 25,000 people, cross-sectional anonymous survey. And they had nearly a 32% response rate and 501 of the surgeons had had suicidal ideation in the last 12 months significantly higher than the general population, and this was related to depression and burnout. But the figure that really I noticed in this study was the fact that only 26% of them had actually sought help for the problem. So the thing that we really have to look at is what are the barriers for us in the medical profession to seeking help with this problem. First of all, there is still, unfortunately, a stigma about mental health issues, and there shouldn't be. Mental health issues should be treated exactly the same as physical health issues. And if we can't get over this for ourselves as a profession, how can we help patients with these problems in our care? We're very busy. We think we're very important. We don't have time to have time off sick. We worry about which services we can go to because of confidentiality. We believe we can manage, we believe it doesn't happen to us. And there is great fear around the um, GMC, the General Medical Council in England, um, being, if, you know, knowing what's going on. Having said that, the GMC has really changed in the last few years, and they only want to know that a doctor is getting the right help and treatment. I have never referred, so I've seen probably six or 800 doctors over the last few years. I have never referred one person to our regulator, who's the GMC. But we deny it doesn't happen to us. This is a fabulous book I'd like to recommend to you, When Doctors Become Patients, by a physician, a psychiatrist in New York called Robert Klitzman. And Robert Klitzman, very sadly, lost his sister in 9-11 and became profoundly depressed afterwards. And he, as part of his rehabilitation, started looking at what happens when doctors become patients, and he wrote this excellent book. And this is one of my favorite quotes from the book. This is a quote from a middle-aged oncologist with metastatic cancer. And he said, we doctors wear magic white coats. We destroy disease all the time. How could it ever attack us? We also, when we get sick, we don't behave the same way as other patients. We often don't have a family doctor. If we do have a family doctor, we don't use them. We often end up self-diagnosing and getting it completely wrong. And we shouldn't self-prescribe, but people still do. In England, actually, you're really not allowed to self-prescribe anymore. I don't know how it is here. And we do something called corridor consultation. So you wake up in the morning and you see, oh, I've got a horrible rash on my arm. You're walking down the corridor. You see a lovely dermatologist who you know. And you say, listen, just have a quick look at my arm. What do you think's going on here? And you often get very, not that they're not a good dermatologist, you don't get the best care in a corridor. So we, it's important that we recognize this. There are also, certainly in the UK, big problems of who manages doctors, who is the manager, who is monitoring any sickness absence, how are they referred to occupational health, and many doctors who are also managers find it very hard to take their doctor hat off and put their manager hat on. So often I might have a senior doctor phone me up and say, Evie, I'm really worried about my junior doctor. They're depressed, they're on citalopram. I don't think it's the right antidepressant, so I've told them to change it to venlafaxine. And I say, just stop there, stop right there. You are not their treating doctor, you are their manager. It's important that you remember that. So it's very important to think about the impact of health on work. If we're not well enough, how does that impact on what we do? 
So there's a concept called presenteeism, and presenteeism is the opposite of absenteeism. It's being in work when you're not well enough to be here, and doctors are very good at presenteeism, as are some other healthcare workers. The problem is, if you're not well enough to be here, you can certainly compromise patient care and expose colleagues and patients to harm. And if you're recovering yourself from an operation, you may recover more slowly. There's a lot of work that's been done looking at the effect of performance on, on, of, on doctors' health on performance. There's an organisation in the UK called NCAS, which is the National Clinical Assessment Service, who assess doctors with performance issues. And the first thing they do is have a health assessment. And 25% of them have significant health issues of one sort or another. Again, there's a big study done in America looking at depressed junior doctors, which showed they made significantly more errors when prescribing medication. Now, this is a whole talk in itself, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this because we have to think about the other way around. What's the effect on, of work on health? So let me just show you. There are six areas of um, Work of workplace design that can affect us in, in the workplace. Demands, what comes in through the door. Control, how much control do we have about what we do. Do we have support from our managers and our peers? Do we have clarity in what we're doing in our role? Are there any relationship problems in the department? And how is change managed? This affects all employees, both on an individual basis, and we can get individually sick with diseases, physical and psychological problems. It also affects the organization, and this is the really important thing as well. So there is increased turnover of staff, reduced staff morale, and particularly increased problems of accidents and litigation in that situation. So there really is a good financial case for looking after staff as well as a moral and ethical case in doing so. And again, this is a very famous graph looking at work-related stress. People talk about stress all the time and say it's a bad thing. Actually, stress isn't necessarily a bad thing at all. The right amount of stress can be good. So this is performance against pressure or stress. I prefer pressure. If actually the level of pressure is low, people are bored, they don't perform well, you then come into your comfort zone. But actually, it's very good to stretch people. This is often where you work best. The problem is when you go into strain and into crisis down the other side. So you know this, but what are the early warning signs if things are becoming more difficult? Well, we all have increased physical symptoms like backache and headaches and tummy upsets and so on. They can cause relationship problems at work and at home with people having arguments. You can have some very negative thoughts about yourself and the future. And there are important... Um, the problems with increasing the unhealthy behavior and not having time for the healthy behavior like exercising. Also, we can just have physical exhaustion and lack of emotional energy. And this is a cartoon from a general practice magazine in the UK. And this is the doctor talking to the patient. So yeah, depressed, not sleeping, low self-esteem, enough about me, what can I do, what can I do for you? So the outcome of all of this is something called burnout, which was described by Christine Maslach in the 1990s. And that is a work-related syndrome of chronic overstress that occurs in caring professions, teachers, social workers, nurses, doctors, and so on. There's three main issues here. One is emotional exhaustion. You just don't have any spare emotional energy for the patients that you're looking after. The second problem is what's called depersonalized depersonalization, which is you stop seeing patients as people. You say, oh, it's the gallbladder in the bed over there, not Mrs. Smith who has cholecystitis, and a real feeling that you're no longer achieving anything. And when I see people who are burnt out and I have to stop them working, it can take three months to get them sorted. It takes a long time to help people in this situation. 
There's lots and lots of work that's been done about burnout all around the world. Um, they're saying now that one in two American physicians uh, have symptoms of burnout. Uh, um, I'll just show you uh, one study that was done in England in 2016, which was done by the Royal College of Anaesthetists, uh, looking at morale of the anaesthetic trainees in the UK. And they had a response from 2,300 trainees Two-thirds of them said that they had physical and mental health problems caused by work, and it was thought that up to 85% of them were at risk of burnout. And the main issues were long hours, real worries about patient safety, difficult shift work, and long commutes to work as well. And it got in, you can see here, it got into the papers. There was a lot in the papers about it in the UK. So what are the stresses in doctors? What are the things that we are juggling uh, all the time? And obviously there are challenges at work. We work with dying patients. We work with um, uh, things like needle stick injuries. You may have injuries at work. Um, at home you have to worry about your, your family and what's going on with them. There are challenges with relationships in the workplace and at home. Um, from a personality perspective, many of us are self-critical perfectionists. Many, many doctors are self-critical perfectionists, and I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. There's, of course, this medical culture that I've just spoken about, that doctors don't get sick, it doesn't happen to us, and lots of biological factors. We don't sleep when we're doing shift work, we often don't eat well enough, we, we don't exercise, and so on. And there is a concept of a double bind. The double bind means that you have, you, you, you're given an emotionally distressing dilemma when you receive two conflicting messages, when one message negates the other. So here is an example of a double bind. To be a good doctor, one needs to be able to relate to patients and be capable of empathy and humanity. I'm sure we'd all agree with that. And look very carefully at this picture. Here is an example of an empathetic doctor. However, just let you look at that for a second. However, yet to survive emotionally, one needs to be detached from patients' pain and suffering. If you got totally, um, if you related very closely to every patient that you saw, you wouldn't last for more than a week. And that, but that's a really hard balance to get right, isn't it? It's not easy. And here's another one. Doctors need to be obsessional and self-critical to avoid mishaps. As I said, it's very good for a patient if we are self-critical perfectionists, but we do have higher, le um, higher levels of self-criticism is associated with higher rates of depression. And what's it like looking after a doctor? What's it like having a doctor as a patient? Well, most of my patients are doctors. Read this very slowly. It's hard even if English is your first language to read this, but read this very slowly and then read it again. I'll just leave you a second. So basically, if you have a patient who is a doctor, do you treat them like a normal patient or do you treat them differently? And I think you actually have to do both. I, I, when I see patients who are doctors, I often say, you know, somebody, a surgeon might come in and say, right, Evie, I've got this wrong and I want this done. And I say, I'm sorry, we're starting at the beginning. Hello, my name is, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take a full history. I'm going to examine you. And then we're going to discuss together what the problem is. Um, but, you know, I appreciate you're a patient with knowledge. Okay, let's just move on then to a little bit about what's happening regarding doctors' health and well-being in England. And I want to start with a very sad story, which is what really started off this, this issue. This was in 2010. This is a doctor called Dr. Daksha Emson, who was bipolar, and she became pregnant, and she couldn't get the right help and treatment that she needed because she was a psychiatrist, and the psychiatric help that she needed was actually in her own department where she was working, and she was embarrassed. She didn't want her notes to be seen in her own department. Postnatally, she became psychotic, and when the baby was three months old, she set herself and the baby on fire, and they both died. It's a very, very tragic story. 
There was a big investigation after that, and the first report that came out was this report, Mental, Mental Health and Ill Health in Doctors, and there was, everybody was criticized in that report. There was a real issue, how do doctors get good confidential help and advice? And another report then came out, which was called Invisible Patients, which again was looking at doctors and other healthcare workers, the main problems being psychological problems, musculoskeletal problems, and dermatological problems as well. So so they came up with a plan which has partially worked, and it was the Health for Healthcare Professionals plan, which had several steps. First of all, everybody needs to have responsibility for their own health and well-being. Then all health professionals and all managers need to be trained in recognizing health problems and, and sending people for support. Then there was going to be special training for general practitioners and occupational health consultants with enhanced skills. There was going to be specialist services around the country for specialist services with specialist psychiatrists with access to secondary care if necessary. However, you'll be interested to know that it's not just in Israel that the money runs out. The money ran out in the UK as well for this program. We did train, and I was involved in training, occupational health consultants in special competencies. General practitioners were trained, psychiatrists were trained. These were the competencies that we uh, train people in in occupational medicine. They were core basic competencies, what you need to know if you have a physician as your patient, and also advanced skills, looking at specific problems of personality disorders, um, psychosis, um, ADHD, and, and other things. And then there were regional champions, and I'm the regional champion for Oxford and Oxfordshire. But they, they only set up one actual centre for doctors to refer to in London. It's called the Practitioner Health Programme. It's been incredibly successful. Any doctor that is living or working in London can refer themselves to this programme. They're seen within a couple of days and they have access to excellent services. Unfortunately, everybody outside of London doesn't have the same thing. So we're, we're, we're very sad that the funding ran out at that point. But anyway, it's a good, good step in the right direction. So what about doctor's health and well-being in our hospital? Okay, so this is a graph to show how many doctors come to my department every year. And um, if you look, the red is consultant, so that's senior doctors. The green is junior doctors, and the blue is all doctors. And I started running a program. I started going out and trying to find doctors um, about 10 years ago in 2008. And you can see since then that the numbers have just gone up and up. And one of the things, so this year, um, we actually saw 150 doctors in the department who came in themselves, and I also see all the doctors in difficulty who are in training. So the deanery is the organization that trains doctors in the UK, and they refer another 50 doctors, 30, 30 to 50 doctors a year to see us. And um, the thing that I'm very proud about is majority of these doctors refer themselves into the department. So they trust us, and we've been raising the profile the whole time around the hospital, and people come and they phone me up and they say, Evie, I'm in trouble, can I come and have a cup of coffee for you? That's a euphemism for I want an appointment. So we say, of course, of course you can come and have a cup of coffee with me, you know, that's no problem. So this is the program that I have set up in the hospital. So there's several stages, first of all, all new doctors who work in the hospital have to go to an induction program that happens once a month. And I have 20 minutes at induction, and I introduce them to occupational health, and we signpost help and support. I have a, an hour with all my first year FY1 doctors um, to talk about occupational health for doctors and self-care for new doctors. I'm going to tell you a bit more about this in a minute. I see all the second-year doctors for a stress-busting and resilience-building workshop, and I give lectures and run workshops for all other levels of doctors as well. So we do three-hour three workshops, and I talk at grand rounds like this and so on. And the really important thing was linking this to the curriculum. To try and show people that this really was important, we found part of the foundation program curriculum. And uh, under safety and clinical governance, it says that doctors need to understand the risks of fatigue, ill health, and stress 
on themselves and on their colleagues, and they need to know what to do about it. So once you can link into a program, you know, you can tell people this is important, and people say, yeah, you're right, we should have this. And these are some of the competencies that we cover in the program. So for example, I won't go through all of them, but you know, health problems mustn't compromise patient care or expose yourself or colleagues to risk. You must keep up to date with your immunizations. Um, medication that you take can really affect performance. One of the medications that is, I think, handed out in the UK like sweeties now is gabapentin for chronic pain. It's fabulous for chronic pain, but it really affects cognition when you start taking it. And people can't be at work. It's very important to remember that. Uh, again, we have to think about bloodborne viruses and the risk of transmission of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and so on. And we tell people where they, need, where they can go and what local and national support services are available for doctors. So this is doctor's induction. As I said, it's about occupational health services, finding a local GP, how you prevent needle stick injuries, and lots of help and advice about where you can get support. This is the program for the first year doctors. Uh, again, the same topics, but we go in a lot more about psychological well-being. Uh, we talk about manual handling and how not to have injuries, how to look after your skin, what to do when you get pregnant, and a lot about self-care for new doctors that I'm going to show you in a minute. The second year program, uh, we talk a lot about resilience. And, and, and how you look out for stress. We use drama, we use some drama in this program, which is great fun. I use cognitive behavior therapy as well to help people understand and challenge when they have negative thoughts and other exercises. So there's a lot of talk about resilience these days. What is resilience, what is it? And it's basically the positive capacity to cope with stress and adversity. Um, some people do have higher levels of natural resilience. It's thought that maybe people with higher emotional intelligence manage better. But there are certainly some personality traits that help us cope from a resilient perspective. Certainly, people who are more confident cope better. If you have good social support at home, it helps. If you have a clear purpose in life, and I think all of us in healthcare do have a clear purpose, we're here to help patients. And the, probably the most important thing is whether you're adaptable or not. Can you manage change? The people who, there will be change all the time in life and in healthcare, and the people that manage change better do, do, do the best. But can we build resilience? Is it worth us running these sort of courses? Is it possible to do this? Well, I think it is possible to do it, and I think that there is good evidence coming out now. Very important to understand personality and what hinders and enables your personality, and to be in the right, the right specialism for yourself. So it's, you know, I do seriously see psychiatrists who don't like talking to patients. You know, you're definitely in the wrong, the wrong, the wrong type of medicine. Um, and um, it's quite important there are ways to modify uh, our perceptions and responses to a situation. And again, I use a lot of cognitive behavior therapy to teach people about that. But looking just generally at our health and well-being is really important as well. So I wanted just to really finish today um, talking through some specific, I've got quite a lot of them, don't worry, of stress-busting tips and things that I think we all need to think about to look after our health and well-being. So the first one is sleep. You know, there, you know doing um, shift work is not easy. And what we find is that people um, start the first day um, of their um, working life as a doctor and nobody has told them how to do shift work. There's some really good tips about how to manage shift work better. And this is a fabulous guide for junior doctors. It's actually on the Royal College of Physicians website and working the night shift preparation, recovery and su survival and recovery. So that's important. Uh, this is something else that's very important as well, um, is really, you know, if you need to go to the toilet, you go to the toilet. And people just don't because we're so busy, we're rushing around, we don't do it. And I feel it's a bit like talking to toddlers, you know. If you need to go to the toilet, you go to the toilet. And, you know, if we can't look after our basic body needs, how do we look after patients in our care? I mean, this is, this is really important. Eating well, I mean, I'm very interested in food and how it affects us. And, you know, when we're working very hard, we often don't eat well, we're running around. 
One of the things we've done in the hospital is actually in some wards, they've tried to put a big fruit bowl on the ward and they're asking patients who give presents not to give chocolates and not to give biscuits, but to bring fruit instead. And this is obviously what we need to be aware of going, going forward, just to, you know, we, we, there's a major obesity crisis going on in the world. Exercise, again, how do we manage in our busy lives to have time for exercise? Well, this is my response to that. What fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? It's your choice, but how do we actually do that? So we're encouraging people to use the stairs, for example. We have lunchtime walks, but you know, it's, it's very hard to get out for a lunchtime walk. You know, we, we, we try to get a gym set up on site and we haven't managed to do that. Hobbies. I think it's incredibly important. Sometimes we work so hard that we actually stop having any hobbies outside of medicine. And I think it's incredibly important that we carry on doing something as well that isn't medicine to be well-rounded and happy individuals. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't have to be mountain climbing. It could be flower arranging, Sudoku, doesn't matter what. Very important to register with a local family doctor and have somebody else looking after you so you're not looking after yourself. I think it's very important to learn some sort of a relaxation technique. We teach all our junior doctors a very short relaxation technique called 478 breathing, which is a great technique to use uh, in acute stress. It can sort of damp down, it's a very slow breathing technique that can damp down the sympathetic, sympathetic response. But of course, the thing everybody's talking about at the moment is mindfulness, and we are running mindfulness for staff in our hospital as well. Again, we talk to everybody about the importance of sharing your stories. We all have bad days, we all lose patience, we all have difficult times. It's very important that people don't go home taking this with them on their own. It's very important we tell people, talk to your colleagues, talk to your peers, talk to your senior doctors. We've all been there, we've all been in that situation. But we find if people go home on their own and worry, that's when they get into trouble. Beware the unhealthy behavior. I think it's less important maybe in Israel because you don't have the sort of alcohol problems that we have in the UK, but we have huge issues in the UK with alcohol and, and uh, alcohol, alcoholism. So, you know, many people go home and they, they will pour a glass of wine and then a bigger glass of wine. So we talk a lot about being very careful what, what you're drinking. And having time to nurture the important relationships in your life. Uh, again, the doctors that I see that really get into trouble are working so hard that they stop doing this. It doesn't matter who those important people are. They can be your parents, they can be your partner, your wife, your husband, your children, your friends. It's really important that you carry on looking after your relationships, hugely important. And laugh more often. It's very, very important that we laugh. Children, they say, laugh several hundred times a day. Um, adults maybe only laugh 15 to 20 times a day. I hope that this slide translates um, from English into Hebrew, but this is a slide, this is a picture that was sent to me by one of my patients, and it certainly made me laugh, but we'll see. I think, I think it still works in Hebrew. I think, <laughs> cool. Good, a few people are laughing, that's good, okay. Um, we have um, excellent feedback from our program. Uh, this was, I think, two years ago, actually. I think I, I spoke to three, 306 doctors at induction, and 97% and said it was a, a good or excellent session. And again, the year one and year two doctors, uh, the year one doctor said 97% said that the content was relevant to, to their training and their level, and the year two doctor said 96% was relevant to their training and their level. And again, very good uh, verbal feedback as well. Um, people were saying, you know, it's important to help doctors lead healthy mental and physical lives, both inside and outside work. It's very important. And I think just before I, a couple of things before I finish that aren't on the slides. I mean, I think one of the most important things here was getting buy-in from the, the medical director of the hospital 
and from the chief executive of the hospital. And there is now in our hospital a health and well-being board to look after all the staff. And the senior member of that board is on the management committee of the hospital. And that we, we have targets, clear targets, of how we're trying to improve health and well-being across all the workers in the hospital. Uh, I'm not saying that we're getting there, uh, but we are going slowly in the right direction. Also, um, you know, a lot of the important parts of this is, is beyond my control. You know, I can do this um, forever and ever, but if people have too many patients to see or the hospital isn't organised properly or there's too much work to do, you know, there's a limit of what I can do. But there's still a lot that we can do to help and support staff. And it's really important that doctors can come forward and, when they have health problems and feel confident that they will be treated appropriately um, with respect and with confidentiality. Uh, just to say there is a, a physician health community around the world. Um, there's a European Association of Physician Health which meets uh, twice a year that I present at. There's also an international conference on Phys physician health run by the American, Canadian and British Medical Association and their next meeting is in October 2018 in Toronto. Canada. Um, and just, just to leave you with this, this is a, an organisation in the UK that helps to support doctors. And again, I'll just leave you, this is their advert, which says, wanted medical staff, high academic achievers only, with strong perfectionists and self-critical traits preferred. Successful candidates will have had five plus years training in party fueled student culture, followed by sleep deprivation and long hours in their 20s, regular exposure to death, loss and human misfortune, never ending exams and lifelong study, constant onerous responsibility for other people's health and well-being, strict hierarchical conservative training with a hint of bullying and intimidation easy access to pharmaceuticals. So I think that says it all. That's why we have to look after ourselves. Thank you very much. Those are my contact details. <laughs>